Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Google I.O. It's a beautiful day. I think warmer than last year. Hope you're all enjoying it. Thank you for joining us. I think we have over 7,000 people here today, as well as many, many people. Uh, we are live streaming this to many locations around the world. So thank you all for joining us today. We have a lot to cover. But before we get started, uh, you know, I had one important business which I wanted to get over with. Towards the end of last year, it came to my attention that we had a major bug in one of our core products. It turns out <laughs> we got the cheese wrong in our burger emoji. Anyway, we went hard to work. I never knew so many people cared about where the cheese is. We fixed it. You know, the irony of the whole thing is I'm a vegetarian in the first place. <laughs> so we fixed it. But uh, hopefully we got the cheese right. But as we were working on this, this came to my attention. I, <laughs> I, did, I don't even want to tell you the explanation the team gave me as to why the foam is floating about the beer. But we restored the natural laws of physics. <laughs> so all is well. We can get back to business. We can talk about all the progress since last year's I.O. I'm sure all of you would agree, it's been an extraordinary year on many fronts. Uh, I'm sure you've all felt it. We are at an important inflection point in computing and it's exciting to be driving technology forward. And it's made us even more reflective about our responsibilities. Expectations for technology vary greatly depending on where you are in the world or what opportunities are available to you. For someone like me who grew up without a phone, I can distinctly remember how gaining access to technology can make a difference in your lives. And we, we see this in the work we do around the world. You see it when someone gets access to a smartphone for the first time. And you can feel it in the huge demand for digital skills we see. That's why we've been so focused on bringing digital skills to communities around the world. So far, we have trained over 25 million people, and we expect that number to rise over 60 million in the next five years. It's clear technology can be a positive force, but it's equally clear that we just can't be wide-eyed about the innovations technology creates. There are very real and important questions being raised about the impact of these advances and the role they'll play in our lives. So we know the path ahead needs to be navigated carefully and deliberately and we feel a deep sense of responsibility to get this right. That's the spirit with which we are approaching our core mission to make information more useful, accessible, and beneficial to society. I've always felt that we were fortunate as a company to have a timeless mission that feels as relevant today as when we started. And we are excited about how we can approach our mission with renewed vigor thanks to the progress we see in AI. AI is enabling this to, to, for us to do this in new ways, solving problems for our users around the world. Last year at Google I.O., we announced Google AI. It's a collection of our teams and efforts to bring the benefits of AI to everyone. And we want this to work globally, so we are opening AI centers around the world. AI is going to impact many, many fields. And I want to give you a couple of examples today. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. Last year, we announced our work on diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness, and we use deep learning to help doctors diagnose it earlier. And we've been running field trials since then at Aravind and Sankara hospitals in India, and the field trials are going really well. We are bringing expert diagnosis to places where trained doctors are scarce. It turned out, using the same retinal scans, there were things which humans quite didn't know to look for, 
but our AI systems offered more insights. Your same eye scan turns out holds information with which we can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack or strokes. So to me, the interesting thing is that you know, more than what doctors could find in these eye scans, the machine learning systems offered newer insights. This could be the basis for a new non-invasive way to detect uh, cardiovascular risk. And we are working, we just published the research, and we are going to be working to bring this to field trials with our partners. Another area where AI can help is to actually help doctors predict medical events. Turns out doctors have a lot of difficult decisions to make, and for them, getting advance notice, say 24 to 48 hours before a patient is likely to get very sick, has a tremendous difference in the outcome. And so we put our machine learning systems to work. We've been working with our partners using de-identified medical records. And it turns out if you go and analyze over 100,000 data points per patient, more than any single doctor could analyze, we can actually quantitatively predict the chance of readmission 24 to 48 hours before, earlier than traditional methods. It gives doctors more time to act. We are publishing our paper on this later today, and we are looking forward to partnering with hospitals and medical institutions. Another area where AI can help is accessibility. You know, we can make day-to-day -day use cases much easier for people. Let's take a common use case. You know, you, you come back home in the night and you turn your TV on. It's not that uncommon to see two people passionately, two or more people passionately talking over each other. Imagine if you are hearing impaired and you're relying on closed captioning to understand what's going on. This is how it looks to you. On a Danny Ainge level, but Don't he's above the level. In other words, he Don't understands enough to... As you can see, it's gibberish. You can't make sense of what's going on. So we have machine learning uh, technology called looking to listen. It not only looks for audio cues, but combines it with visual cues to clearly disambiguate the two voices. Let's see how that can work, maybe in YouTube. Not on a Danny Ainge level, but he's above a Colangelo level. In other words, he understands enough to... You said, you said it was all right to lose on purpose. You said it's all right to lose on purpose and advertise that to the fence. It's perfectly okay. You said it's okay. We have nothing else to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> But you can see how we can put technology to work to make an important day-to-day -day use case profoundly better. You know, the great thing about technology is it's constantly evolving. In fact, we can even apply machine learning to a 200-year-old technology, Morse code, and make an impact in someone's quality of life. You know, it's great to reinvent products with AI. Gboard is actually a great example of it. Every single day, we offer users, and users choose over 8 billion auto corrections each and every day. Another example of a, one of our core products, which we are redesigning with AI, is Gmail. We just had a new, fresher look for Gmail, a recent redesign. Hope you're all enjoying using it. We are bringing another feature to Gmail. We call it Smart Compose. So as the name suggests, we use machine learning to start suggesting phrases for you as you type. All you need to do is to hit tab and keep auto-completing. In this case, it understands the subject is Taco Tuesday. It suggests chips, salsa, guacamole. It, it takes care of mundane things like addresses so that you don't need to worry about it. You can actually focus on what you want to type. I've been loving using it. I've been sending a lot more emails to the company, not sure what the company thinks of it. <laughs> but it's been great. We are rolling out Smart Compose to all our users this month and hope you enjoy using it as well. <laughs> Another product which we built from the ground up using AI is Google Photos works amazingly well, and at scale. 
You know, if you click on one of these photos, what we call the photo viewer experience, where you're looking at one photo at a time, so that you understand the scale, every single day, there are over 5 billion photos viewed by our users each and every day. So we want to use AI to help in those moments. So we are bringing a new feature called suggested actions. Essentially suggesting smart actions right in context for you to act on. Say, for example, you went to a wedding and you're looking through those pictures. We understand your friend Lisa is in the picture and we offer to share the three photos with Lisa and with one click, those photos can be sent to her. So the anxiety where everyone is trying to get the picture on their phone, I think we can make that better. Say, for example, if the photo in the same wedding, if the photos are underexposed, our AI systems offer a suggestion to fix the brightness right there, one tap, and we, we can fix the brightness for you. Or if you took a picture of a document which you want to save for later, we can recognize, convert the document to PDF, and make it... make it much easier for you to use later. You know, we want to make all these simple cases delightful. By the way, AI can also deliver unexpected moments. So for example, if you have this picture, cute picture of your kid, we can make it better. We can drop the background color, pop the color, and make the kid even cuter. Or if you happen to have a very special memory, something in black and white, maybe of your mother and grandmother, we can recreate that moment in color and, and make that moment even more real and special. All these features are going to be rolling out to Google Photos users in the next couple of months. The reason we are able to do this is because for a while, we've been investing in the scale of our computational architecture. This is why last year we talked about our tensor processing units. These are special purpose machine learning chips. These are driving all the product improvements you're seeing today. And we've made it available to our cloud customers. Since the last year, we've been hard at work. And today, I'm excited to announce our next generation, TPU 3.0. These chips are so powerful that for the first time, we've had to introduce liquid cooling in our data centers. And we put these chips in the form of giant pods. Each of these pods is now 8x more powerful than last year. It's well over 100 petaflops. And this is what allows us to develop better models, larger models, more accurate models, and helps us tackle even bigger problems. And one of the biggest problems we are tackling with AI is the Google Assistant. Our vision for the perfect assistant is that it's naturally conversational. It's there when you need it so that you can get things done in the real world. And we are working to make it even better. We want the assistant to be something that's natural and comfortable to talk to. And to do that, we need to start with the foundation of the Google Assistant, the voice. Today, that's how most users interact with the assistant. Our current voice is codenamed Holly. She was a real person. She spent months in our studio, and then we stitched those recordings together to create voice. But 18 months ago, we announced a breakthrough from our DeepMind team called WaveNet. Unlike the current systems, WaveNet actually models the underlying raw audio to create a more natural voice. It's closer to how humans speak, the pitch, the pace, even all the pauses that convey meaning. We want to get all of that right. So we've worked hard with WaveNet, and we are adding, as of today, six new voices to the Google Assistant. Let's have them say hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm your Google Assistant. Welcome to Shoreline Amphitheater. We hope you'll enjoy Google I.O. Back to you, Sundar. You know, our goal is one day to get the right accents, languages, and dialects right globally. You know, WaveNet can make this much easier. With this technology, we started wondering, 
who we could get into the studio with an amazing voice. Take a look. Couscous, a type of North African semolina and granules made from crushed durum wheat. I want a puppy with sweet eyes and a fluffy tail who likes my haikus. Don't we all? Happy birthday to the person whose birthday it is. Happy birthday to you. John Legend. He would probably tell you he don't want to brag, but he'll be the best assistant you ever had. Can you tell me where you live? You can find me on all kinds of devices. Phones, Google Homes, and if I'm lucky, in your heart. That's right. John Legend's voice is coming to the assistant. Clearly, he didn't spend all the time in the studio answering every possible question that you could ask. But WaveNet allowed us to shorten the studio time, and the model can actually capture the richness of his voice. His voice will be coming later this year in certain contexts so that you can get responses like this. Good morning, Sundar. Right now in Mountain View, it's 65 with clear skies. Today, it's predicted to be 75 degrees and sunny. At 10 a.m., you have an event called Google I.O. Keynote. Then, at 1 p.m., you have margaritas. Have a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to 1 p.m. <laughs> so John's voice is coming later this year. I'm really excited we can drive advances like this with AI. We are doing a lot more with the Google Assistant. And to talk to you a little bit more about it, let me invite Scott onto the stage. Dear scientists, I often wonder what it would be like to live in prehistoric times had a pandemic like the one we are in right now hit us back then. Would we be able to recover soon from such a huge blow? I know one thing for sure now, life would not have been easy if it were not for science. No words can express our gratitude for the life-changing works that you all have been doing. This National Science Day, we want you to know that you are our heroes. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for building a better tomorrow. Sincerely. <laughs>